Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this great film screening and discussion event. My name is Pitasana. I am a peace campaigner uh, here at uh, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Uh, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace was established in 1960. Uh, it is Canada's oldest national feminist peace group. VOW is based on the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat and the Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. First Nations people in Canada have experienced terrible trauma at the hands of the federal government due to the loss of their land and culture, residential schools, poor social welfare services, water advisories, and the industrialization and militarization of their land. We will hear more about that this evening. This event has been sponsored by Val Peace, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the Sound Defense Alliance. Also, this event has been organized by the No Fighter Jets Coalition. The coalition aims to put pressure on the Canadian government to cancel its plans to purchase 88 advanced fighter jets. The government plans to purchase these fighter jets to replace the Royal Canadian Air Force's existing fleet of CF-18 fighter jets. The federal government claims the cost of the 88 new fighter jets is $19 billion. However, the No New Fighter Jets Coalition has found that $19 billion is only the sticker price. Depending on which fighter jets the government decides to purchase, it's very likely to be Lockheed uh, Martin's F-35. The true life cycle costs of these jets will amount to an estimated $77 billion. For more information regarding the government's planned purchase of these costly, environmentally destructive and futile fighter jets, and what our coalition is doing to stop this purchase, please visit www.nofighterjets.ca and please follow us on our social media. The No Fighter Jets Coalition is also planning a week of action when Parliament begins the week of November 22nd. So please stay tuned for more details on that. Uh, to those in attendance today, please feel free to introduce yourself in the comments section and also please feel free to put questions in the chat throughout this event. Today's event will consist of a screening of the short film Jetline made by Vermont filmmakers Dwayne Peterson III and Patrick McCormack, who are here with us today, as well as a discussion with activists in different parts of the U.S. and Canada resisting the basing of these trauma-inducing fighter jets. I would now like to tell you a little bit about the filmmakers before I hand it off to them to discuss and screen their short film, as well as to tell you their personal experiences resulting from the basing of the F-35 fighter jets in Burlington, Vermont. Dwayne Peterson III is an editor, filmmaker, and film programmer exploring new ways of seeing and understanding space, memory, and time through a critical geography framework. As a documentary filmmaker, he takes an unorthodox approach to reinterpret familiar spaces and bring overlooked histories to light. Dwayne lives in Burlington, Vermont. Patrick McCormack works as a photographer, editor, creative director for the Climate Action Film Festival. He lives just a few miles from the runway at Burlington International Airport. In his photo work, he acts as a passive witness to moments that may otherwise go overlooked. The injustice of monopolized media and the broad lack of political representation for working people are foundational motivations in his work. Uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Prasanna, thank you. And thank you all for being here tonight. I'm, I'm Duane and, and this is Patrick. Yeah, it's tough to follow your own written bio, but I appreciate that. That uh, definitely hypes this up pretty nicely. Um, so, uh, Dwayne, do you want me to go first? Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's nice to see everybody here. This is uh, an exciting event to be part of. So we're, we're really grateful that, uh, for the invite and we're happy to share our experience for, for what it's worth. Um, we are calling you from sort of the uh, guinea pig site. Uh, the F-35s fly here in Vermont. Um, we've been, what is it? It's been two years now. 
Um, and about a, a year after their first flight, um, Dwayne and I recognized that the local media and national media narrative really excluded the feeling of living underneath these warplanes. Um, but we also saw a, 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 a tragic injustice uh, and a, a disconnect between how people were voting and what they were saying and what, what reality came to Burlington uh, being the F-35s. Um, people overwhelmingly did not support this being based here in Vermont. It's, it's really completely uh, out of line with the, the supposed values of our state and the lived reality of it um, was horrifying. So um, Dwayne and I set out to collect testimonials uh, from people around us and weave them into a film that you'll see here today. Um, and since we, the film debuted in April, we've been touring it around and um, really using it as like a warning um, to, you know, other places where the F-35 will, will go. Um, and so as you, you see the film in just a second here, um, it's really comprised of voicemails that we received from an anonymous hotline. Um, and that in the COVID era was sort of the best way to reach people, but it also turned out to be an unexpectedly um, really honest and intimate way that people could articulate um, this, this experience when nobody in power really cared to listen. Um, Dwayne, if there's anything else you want to add, I'll hand it over to you. Um, yeah, so we um, set up a hotline for, for this film project. We invited um, members of the Burlington and Winooski communities to call in and express their feelings uh, about um, the F-35s and how they had been affecting them over the first year uh, of them being based here. Uh, so I'll just show you this. We, we hung up larger versions of this flyer, you know, um, let's say seeking F-35 comments, all anonymous, leave a voicemail. And uh, if, you, if you called this number, it's still active now, although we haven't been flyering since the film um, has, has wrapped up, but um, we, we collected over 150 voicemails and we uh, have condensed them down into this 12 minute short film. Uh, like Patrick said, I think as a warning or a testament, a document of what, um, what the first year with living with F-35s in Vermont was like for the people on the ground here. Um, so without much further ado, I think I'll get started. It's uh, just 12 minutes. Um, so I look forward to... Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the reception and our experience right after the film. And, um, and please uh, give us our time cue so that we keep things on schedule. It is ridiculous that the people involved in the running of Vermont, and specifically the area of Burlington, Vermont, will allow 20 F-35 supersonic jets to be used landing and taking off in the center of a city. It is unconscionable that this would be allowed.
Hello. One of the F-35s just went by, and it's horrifying. I don't feel safe with the F-35. I feel that something could go wrong, and we would all be in danger. Please stop the F-35. It does not belong here. I think the jets are great, and I wish they would fly more often. And I really wish they would fly very, very low over Burlington four or five times a day. Bye. I was outside walking on the streets of Winooski yesterday when three F-35s flew over. It was deafening. The impact of this noise, it affects not just your hearing, but your whole body, the vibrations. I covered my ears, it did almost no good. To describe this, uh, to say that this is disturbing is a, a complete understatement. It's a violent sensory assault. So these lying scumbags who brought this plane here, like Leahy, first of all, but all of the opportunists, parasites, bootlickers who supported this thing, may they all rot in hell for what they're doing to this community. On the days when I know that the F-35s won't be flying, so that's some of the weekends and Mondays. There's a deep quiet that settles in me, very much at a visceral level. It's a kind of peace. It's very scattering to have the sound of them so close. It affects us deep in our hearts, in our viscera. It affects us in a way that's hard to say. This is the wrong place to base the F-35s. It's not working. We were lied to, repeatedly lied to about how loud those jets are. And every time when people ask them about that, they said, oh, well, we, are, we can't give you a number about how the decibels. Bullshit. That is, we were lied to. When the jets fly over, my blood pressure has risen up as far as 190 over 100, which is not safe for me. Um, I have been recording, getting recordings as high as 125 decibels, one, two, three, four, five jets, one after another, severely shaking my house and rattling the windows. Uh, very seriously disturbing to my health and to my well-being. Please take note of my complaint. I call all the time. My complaints are not registered. I've written, B. Tang does not respond to my complaints. The whole experience has been very debilitating. Thank you for listening. Everybody who objects to the F-35s need to get over it. Yeah, exactly. We live on the border. They're part of NORAD. They're absolutely incredible, <coughs> technological, amazing pieces of American fighter 
patriot pride. Exactly. Exactly. Do you really think that you're going to go up against the military or the National Guard? No, no. no. Fucking good luck. As much as I love them, in a sense, because it, it um, just gives you such awe and it's so incredible. Um, at the same time, having them here and during COVID and overhead and during the day and then some during the night, and um, it's mind-blowing what it does to your body. Um, like the entire inside of your body is shaking um the boom is such that you can't i mean it's, it's like a it's like an internal um combustion of your body and your head and it's and it's painful um and then my children obviously i, I can't even imagine um but i know that they have a tough time doing their remote learning that's for sure um i mean with windows closed and everything else doesn't quite matter because uh, because it's as if they're inside your body when they're going over. Every time I hear the F-35 flying overhead, I'm forced to stop any conversation I may be having and remember that we are complicit in increasing the likelihood of war at the same time that the people of this country are going hungry. This makes me very sad. My concern about the F-35 goes beyond just the noise. Every time I hear them, I'm reminded of how we have perverted our uh, view of what is uh, patriotism. It appears from the discussions that have happened in the past over the F-35 that supporting military equipment has now been equated with being patriotic. It is not. And people who stand up against these are considered unpatriotic. To me, the F-35 is the poster child of everything that is wrong with the military-industrial-political complex. So the F-35 being here in Vermont is a symbol of how far astray we've gone in this country from peace and security for all to unquestioned support for military weapon systems in a false belief that this somehow is needed to keep our country safe and secure. In one week, my wife and I are going to be leaving Vermont. Uh, the daily assault of the F-35s over our home it's just more than we want to live with. Um, shame on the National Guard. They're supposed to be protecting us, but they actually assault us every day. And shame on the National Guard also for their thousand gallon of flight to contribute to the climate crisis. It's just, uh, it's just absolutely abhorrent what's going on here. Thank you.
Thank you, Dwayne and Patrick, for sharing uh, that very eye-opening uh, uh, short film uh, and uh, with our audience. With our audience, and our next speaker is James Mark Lees. James Mark Lees is a patent lawyer in South Burlington, Vermont. He has a bachelor's in biology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a master's in physics from the University of Massachusetts. He was an engineer at IBM for 20 years and at SolarX for five years. He holds 43 patents, most assigned to IBM. 30 of his publications on F-35 basing are in Truthout, Alternet, the Burlington Free Press, 05401 plus and VT Digger. James also has a list of articles on his Substack regarding canceling the F-35. I'll put a link to that in the chat box as well. James will discuss his opposition to the basing of fighter jets in Burlington, Vermont, the threat fighter jets pose to the cognitive health and learning of children and how basing fighter jets in Vermont is a violation of the United States own laws of war. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, the film really demonstrated how people are experiencing the F-35, that it's causing pain, that it's causing injury, and that it's causing suffering. Now, what are the Vermont National Guard pilots training to do? Well, one thing we know they're training is to commit war crimes because they're hurting people right here in Vermont. They're training to hurt people. That's what their training is accomplishing by being located in a densely populated area. The purpose of the training is to get them ready to do the same darn thing or worse to people in the countries where they're gonna be dropping bombs. If they didn't want, if they wanted them to be properly trained so that they observe the laws of war, they wouldn't be doing it in a densely populated area. And we know that they're going to be doing it in other densely populated areas. It's important to build a campaign to put a stop to that. So what are some of the problems? It's not just the noise, although the noise is a huge part of what we heard about in the film. The air, but I'll start with the noise. The Air Force itself in its environmental impact statement eight years ago said that noise at the level of the F-35 would be causing hearing damage, re repeated exposure to noise at the level of the F-35. That is said it would be at a, that people would be exposed to 115 decibels on takeoff and less, slightly less on landing, depending on how high the jet was. Well, we've measured 115 decibels in populated areas around in the flight path uh, using a calibrated recording sound meter. And we know that the F-35 is at a level that the Air Force itself says can cause hearing damage. But it's not just hearing damage. The Air Force environmental impact statement also reported that noise at much lower level of civilian, of civilian aircraft can cause learning damage and can impair the cognitive development of children. And they did the studies or they reported the studies that were done at some of the more heavily used civilian airports. But the F-35 is much, much louder than any civilian aircraft. So, uh, children are being exposed to F-35 flights hundreds of times a month. The schedule for takeoff of the 20 jets based at the Burlington Airport is so intense that our children are being exposed 
And this is going to have negative effects on their hearing, on their learning, starting at a very young age. Um, I'd also like to point out a few of the other uh, issues with the F-35 beyond the noise issue. Climate, the plane burns more than 20 gallons a minute. That's like a full tank of gas for your car every minute. And what's the point of all this training? To train to make war for oil, You're using massive amounts of oil to make war for oil. The whole point of the plane, it's irresponsible. We've got a climate catastrophe coming right at us. And not, there's nothing the F-35 can do to prevent that catastrophe. In fact, it's driving us toward it with every training flight. There's also the crash risk, a massive crash risk for the F-35, much, much more than the older um, metal-bodied fighter jets like the F-16. So if that crashed, there'd be a giant fuel fire, a huge um, fire wherever it landed or wherever it hit the ground. But with the F-35, the body itself is combustible. It's a carbon composite body. And it, and it um, according, to Air For um, according to military documents, when these carbon composites burn, they emit all kinds of toxic carcinogenic and mutagenic chemicals. And a huge area would be rendered uninhabitable. The F-35 being a new plane has a much higher risk of crash than planes that have been around for millions of flight hours. The F-35, all three versions have less than a quarter of a million flight hours put together. They don't have enough crashes to really be able to identify what is the crash rate. And certainly just for the version that we're getting in Vermont, it's much too low a number of flight hours so that the public is being exposed to a very high crash risk as well as a very high crash consequence if it does crash. There's also the human shielding aspect. The F-35 is designed to carry nuclear weapons. And it's going to be this year, next year, they're going to be making modifications to the program and to the hardware and software so that it can carry nuclear weapons. We don't know which ones, whether they'll be doing that in Vermont or whether they'll wait to forward deploy them around China or Iran or Venezuela, or wherever they're going to be using them before they make those slight modifications. But the F-35 is a nuclear bomb delivery system, and that's why it's legitimate for enemies to target their nuclear missiles at the Burlington Airport. That airport is located amidst three cities. It's located in the city of South Burlington. The runway going north aims at Winooski, one mile away, 1,700 yards away and also off to the side, the city of Burlington. And in the other direction, immediately at the end of the runway is the town of Williston with residential, commercial, industrial, and uh, preschools. There are seven schools identified by the Air Force within the target zone. The Air Force actually made a target area. That's how they communicate the noise profile. So that it looks like a target, only it's instead of round, like the kind you throw darts at, it's oval shaped, centered on the runway. So when it takes off, where is the most intense noise? It's an area about five miles long by one mile wide, centered on the runway. So the runway is less is a mile and a half long, and it extends two miles in each direction and about half a mile on each side of the runway. That's the noise the most intense noise zone where for our airport in that zone, it's about five square miles, more than 6,000 people live, almost 3,000 
working class homes. It's all working class areas. This is totally oriented towards uh, low income, minority, and working class populations. Uh, lots of immigrants. Uh, it's, a, it's really a social injustice on steroids. There's also, so, and there's, and then there's the chemical poisoning because to put out, they're worried about the plane catching fire. They're worrying about a crash. So they have to practice a lot to put out these chemical fires. So they use this chemical foam with PFAS and they poison the water, not just at the Burlington airport, but everywhere around the country where they're doing that. Any place there's a military base, there's PFAS poisoning. This is, the, the military has turned itself into a war crime just by its existence in, in uh, civilian areas in the United States, let alone when it goes to Iraq and murders a million people or Afghanistan or Syria or Libya or Somalia or every place else where we've already been at war. This is something to build a campaign around and to, and to put a, uh, uh, to really do our best to put a stop, uh, stop to. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm working fast. So um, I'd like to just say something about the laws of war that are being uh, insulted here. The, the international community going back more than a hundred years and much expanded after World War II created a body of law that all countries are supposed to conform to. And it's been codified in written, in, in treaties and also in, in custom, what they call customary international law, supposedly not written down, but it's law that everybody's supposed to conform to. But the US military, to its credit, codified the whole thing in a 1236 page document uh, it's the Department of Defense Law of War Manual. And um, so all of this, all of these, it really boils down to five principles. Uh, one of them is you can't do a military operation unless there's military necessity. So a military operation could be training. It could be attacking. It could be any kind of military operation. There has to be some military necessity, particularly if they're gonna be civilians impacted by it. Well, there is no military necessity for training in a densely populated area. There may be a necessity to train, but not in a densely populated area. There's plenty of places in the US and Canada and all kinds of countries where you can be far away from the, so why are they doing it in populated areas? As I said, they wanna train them to violate the laws of war. It's the only explanation. There's no reason. There's no military necessity. They're violating the rules to do it. Same thing for the next rule I'll talk about, which is distinction. Military forces wear uniforms to distinguish themselves from the, from the civilians. But there's all kinds of other rules for dis regarding distinction. One of them is to keep military forces separate from populated areas. So you're not using the populated area as a human shield to protect yourself as a military force from attack by shielding. This is a war crime too. And so also, so you don't hurt the civilians by your own military operations, which is what we're, they're doing with the F-35 and they know it. And there's more of these rules, there's a uh, proportionality during an attack, you're not supposed to make the attack, to launch the attack, if the uh, harm to civilians is disproportionate to the military advantage. So, well, what's the military advantage? There is none because it's just training. There's no war going on in Vermont. There's no military advantage towards winning, that's what they mean by military advantage, towards winning the war something you can do to defeat the enemy, to end the war as quickly as possible, is what it's all about. Well, there is none. You don't have a military advantage. 
at all for training in Vermont. So you shouldn't be hurting the hair, one hair on a civilian's head. That's wrong. Well, they're hurting thousands of people. How could they not know this? They do know. It. They're doing it for the purpose of training the, the members of the guard so that they will be used to it when they're bombing civilians. And then there's honor. Honor is the one that has also to do with human shielding. Honor, it's another, you're supposed to have honor. What's honorable about hurting civilians? The whole thing is dishonor. And unnecessary suffering is another one. Humanity. These are the five laws of war. You're not supposed to be just being vicious, even with the other, the enemy soldiers, you, not to cause enemy, to, to cause unnecessary suffering uh, in ways that are just uh, too horrible. And th so they've outlawed certain weapons and so on, or how you use a weapon. Well, this is what they're doing. They're using the F-35 in a way that really hurts people. And it's totally unnecessary suffering. Why are they doing it in a city? To use it in a city is causing unnecessary suffering. This, they viol if they violate one of those laws, it's a war crime. They're violating World 5. This is, but it's not just the, the regulations, the military regulations. There's also the Universal Code of Military Justice, which is a federal statute. It's a crime to be violating reckless endangerment and other provisions of the UCMJ. And there's the US War Crimes Act. If you're causing injury to a bodily organ, that's a severe injury. And they're causing injuries to the hearing organs. They're causing injury to the brain, to the um, cognitive development of children. They're causing injury to, according to recent studies, to the heart and, and um, they call it heart disease and, um, and stroke is another factor from exposure to high noise levels during your lifetime. And so this is all being directed at civilians and we're seeing a, an intense amount of uh, war crimes. I just like to conclude by um, re-emphasizing uh, that we do have a publication we're putting out very regularly, more once or twice a week. We've been posting articles that go into the, the laws of war and the crimes against civilians, the racial injustice, the crimes against immigrants. Um, so it's called cancelf35.substack.com. There's no hyphen in the F35, just cancelf35.substack.com. If you're interested in that, I'll put my, uh, you, can, you can just go to that, um, go to that page and, um, and you can either subscribe, it's free. It's always gonna be free, no advertising. And uh, there's all kinds of documents on there that may, you may be able to take advantage of and learn from or uh, share with others in your community. One of them is a 62 page complaint to the inspector general of the Vermont National Guard, which goes through the laws of war and the regulations, the constitutional rights that are violated, both US constitutional rights and Vermont constitutional rights. And so it's a really like a, a manual for uh, putting the uh, war makers and the uh, people who are directing and controlling these military jets in populated areas on trial. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James, for uh, uh, for that great presentation, conveying how these fighter jets are being used to strengthen the military industrial complex at the expense of everyday residents in v Vermont. Uh, this was also conveyed brilliantly by Dwayne and Patrick short film. Now, the fact that these F-35s are purposely designed with the ability to carry nuclear weapons, further escalating the growing threat of nuclear war. Many people don't realize these facts. So thank you, James, for pointing that out. Uh, also a reminder to those in attendance, if you have questions, please 
uh, please post them uh, in the chat. We will uh, be having a Q&A period uh, for this event, so we will take up those questions. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Vicky Berenson. Vicki Berenson is one of several organizers for Safe Skies Clean Water Wisconsin, opposing the sitting of F-35 Joint Strike fighter jets at the Truat Air National Guard Base in Madison, Wisconsin. She has contributed to anti-violence and social justice work for many years with a variety of organizations as a volunteer or staff and currently serves on the board of Wisconsin Faith Voices for Justice. Vicki has worked with food and housing cooperatives and nonprofits, including Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice, doing bookkeeping, outreach, training, and technology support. Vicki will discuss her work on the campaign to stop the sitting of F-35 at the Trua Air National Guard Base in Madison, the threat that placing fighter jets in Madison is having on those communities living in that area. Uh, thank you, Vicki. The floor is yours. Hi. Um... Well, I'd like to thank James, actually. Well, thank you all for having me. I'd like to thank James for um, talking so much about the impact of the jets. And um, so I don't have to say much about that, except for a few things. But I'll talk more about what we have done in our community and what we're doing now. Um, so Truax Air National Guard Base is located in the city of Madison um, in a densely populated urban neighborhood where there are, prim it's, it's one of the last affordable neighborhoods in the city. Um, it's got a higher concentration of um, people of color, children and low income families. And that was explicitly stated in the environmental impact statement um, that was prepared for the construction that has to happen to bring the F-35 jets to the air base. To, to house them there. However, um, the Air National Guard and the, the Air Force probably mostly um, made the decision to bring them here anyway, even though of the five places being considered, we were the most impacted that way. Um, but I'd like to just show you some of the things that we've done and I'll talk a little more about it as, as I show slides. So at the very beginning, this is um, the Alliant Energy Center, which is a convention center. We, um, someone saw a little thing in a, a very tiny notice in a newspaper saying there would be a public comment period about this environmental impact statement. It was not publicized at all. Fortunately, someone um, found out and we started publicizing um, widely and it pushed the Air National Guard to have a public information session at the, and there were many hundred people there. This is one of our alder people, our, our um, common council members who is um, spoke in opposition to the F-35 after learning more about it, but it was our group that really was responsible for um, educating people and getting people aware of all this because people weren't um, because they, it was kind of under the radar. Um, our group is called Safe Skies Clean Water Wisconsin and we formed in July, 2019. So um, we managed to submit more than 6,000, well, Wisconsin, <laughs> our community submitted more than 6,000 comments um, on, the, on the environmental impact statement, mostly opposing it. And that was an unprecedented number of comments. It was ignored in their final decision. Um, so let's see, in 2020, in February, you can see, oh, this must be a little past February, but um, we had um, a demonstration at the air base. And this, this must be after February, this must be <laughs> because people are wearing masks. But here was, yeah, our demonstration at the air base. Um, we had maybe 800 people and speakers, we had, um, unions, we had a lot of people there. Um, I don't know if James mentioned the, um, you know, that one of the things we were up against was the local chamber of commerce that kept saying, saying um, it's all about bringing jobs to the area. And our, our Senator Tammy Baldwin, who is very liberal and very wonderful on domestic issues, but 
seems to be in the pockets of the military and she um, spouted the same um, BS about the job because it is fairly well documented that that dollar for dollar more jobs are created in the civilian sector, particularly healthcare, education, and um, all, and um, renewable energy um, than the military. Besides which, we aren't paying for it directly. So we have a we have neighborhood groups who are still um, making a lot of noise about this. A lot of it is about the water because of the PFAS that James talked about that the F-35 um, requires a lot more PFAS containing firefighting foam to, um, to put out a fire <clears throat> than the current aluminum um, jets that we have. So um, there's that. And plus, they haven't done anything to clean up the existing PFAS contamination, which caused one of the wells to be shut down in the city. Another thing is about um, fossil fuels. The US military is the number one consumer of fossil fuels on the planet. Um, and the highest proportion of that is, is jet fuel. And one of the things um, people don't talk about very much is when, it's, when the um, climate um, impact globally is looked at, you know, like which country is producing the most the, the most um, ozone depleting greenhouse gases. Somehow in a lot of those calculations, the US military got exempt. So how much the US actually contributes toward climate change is not clear is not accurately stated at all. And then, you know, there's the whole thing about militarizing our communities. What else? And I believe James talked about this is a weapon pointed at us because it's creating harm to our community, but it's also making us a target. So tell the truth, really tell the truth. We are up against, you know, a lot of people who don't want to tell the truth. So um, what we're doing now, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, is we are suing. Um, we have two. We have two lawsuits in progress. One was filed December, last December, and it challenges the National Guard Bureau over the environmental review for construction at the base, and um, saying that it should have required an environmental impact study and asking them to block construction. Of course, they've already started construction and the. Uh, the um, judge said, well, we'll look at this in a year or so. So, you know, we're kind of like, you know, what are we going to do about that? March 2021, we challenged the inadequacy of environmental impact statement, filed a lawsuit. Um, the environmental impact statement was really based on evaluating the impacts of PFAS, air quality, groundwater, and the health effects of noise. So those, those things are in progress. We looked at filing an environmental justice complaint. And we're not sure if that's viable or not, but it would challenge the disproportional impact on low-income communities, people of color, and children. Um, we are working on strategic planning, figuring out who are the decision makers and the influencers. We're working with um, trying to um, educate and pull in some of the supporters of our, our senator who has been um, behind this F-35 program, Senator Baldwin. Um, we're, we are advised by our Congressman, Mark Pocan, who is one of the people who consistently um, brings bills, proposes bills in Congress to lower the Pentagon budget. Um, one of his ideas is that um, the F-35 itself is our best talking point because of its inadequacies and its dangers. Um, he thinks legal strategies might work, but we don't know. Um, the media is a real big problem because they don't talk about the inadequacies of the F-35 and the cost. They talk about the noise. And then 
you know, the pushback is, oh, stop complaining. This is for the security of your nation. It's the sound of freedom. Um, so the other thing we're trying to do is create awareness of the impact on not just the immediate neighborhood, because we do have the immediate neighborhood, except for some people. We have most of the immediate neighborhood and the leadership on our side, but um, the rest of the city, the rest of the state, um, you know, the cost to taxpayers so far has in the last several years has been over $200 a year in our taxes going to the F35 program. One of the things that I was going to mention is that in 1994, there was a proposal in Western Wisconsin. Um, we call it the Driftless Area because it's, it's hilly. It's not where, where the glaciers haven't, um, haven't flattened the, the land. Um, there was the Air National Guard proposed expanding low level flights of F-16 fighter jets in the area. And they also proposed an expansion of a um, bombing range. And what happened there is the Ho-Chunk tribe. So we live on Ho-Chunk um, tribal land or that was formerly Ho-Chunk tribal land. Now it's sort of Ho-Chunk land. Um, anyway, um, the Ho-Chunk tribe really became um, seriously opposed to the expansion of the bombing range, um, but also the, F, the um, low level flights. And then what, what the turning point was, was when Amish farmers got involved and um, talked about how the noise from low level flights would cause their horses to rear and create accidents. And they petitioned against what they called visual symbols of war, which is against their religion. And that was actually the turning point and the Air National Guard um, canceled their expansion of the F-16 flights, the more F-16 low level flights. However, what the military did was they divided the opposition. Um, the Ho-Chunk were more opposed, were more strongly opposed to the expansion of the bombing range. So what they did was they got their bombing range and, but they, cancel the low level flights and that appeased the people who were opposed to the low level flights. And so the coalition kind of got weakened. Um, so that's just something to consider, um, you know, when you're working on building coalitions, you know, who can you draw in and how can you make sure that people um, stick with it and support each other, even if your own interests are, um, are being met. So I don't know that I have a whole lot more. We have a lot of local, we will have a lot of local costs for PFAS mitigation because the military is not picking up the cost for all of it. You know, we have a lot of polluted groundwater and we have streams that um, people in lower income communities fish in or had been fishing in. Um, a lot of that subsistence fishing and those streams are are way you know over the top polluted with PFAS from the firefighting foam that has been used in the training at the airport. Um, last thing I could say is that I live three miles from the airport, so I'm not real close, you know. But I, I hear um, airplanes go by, and every time an F-16 or sometimes I mean we have F-16s based at Truex, um, but we get other planes too. We get F-18s and other other planes too. Whenever they go by, I used to get really angry and it used to just make my blood boil. And I finally decided I had to make peace with it somehow. And what I did was I thought about the people flying the planes and thought those are just people. And for whatever reason, they joined the Air Force or the Air National Guard. They're eating the Kool-Aid, drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, they're taught to um, think that what they're doing is a good thing. And I feel really sad for them. And it makes me feel less angry whenever the planes go by. I mean, I had to just do that for myself. So I could go on and on about stuff, but I think that I will stop and let it go for the next speaker.
Thank you, Vicky, for that great presentation. And as you very importantly pointed out, you know, more jobs are created through investing in healthcare infrastructure than through investing in the military. You know, an, an argument made for procuring and basing fighter jets is that it creates jobs and it's good for the economy. But that's not true when you compare it with investing in these other sectors where a far greater number of jobs can be created and you won't be harming people and the environment. So thank you very much for that presentation. Our next speaker is Christine Hurley. Christine Hurley has been an advocate, an advocate and activist for improved health care for underserved communities in Seattle since the 1970s. Hurley was the founding director of the Pike Market Medical Clinic, a community health center serving downtown Seattle and a co-founder of the Pike Place Market Foundation. Since 2014, Hurley has been a faculty member in the Community-Oriented Public Health Practice Program in the University of Washington's School of Public Health. She has been an active member of the Sound Defense Alliance since its inception with a particular interest in the community health impacts of noise from the Navy's growler jets based on Whidbey Island. Today, Christine will speak about her work as a research committee member with Sound Defense Alliance in opposing the noise of the growlers uh, in the Pacific Northwest and highlighting their adverse impacts. Uh, thank you, Christine. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. That was a really long introduction, so I hope it didn't cut off my 10 minutes, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, I'm as uh, introduced. I've got a long background in community health and public health, and I am, I live in Coopville and near the epicenter of the US Navy's, new US Navy's Growler Jet Program based on Whidbey. Um, I've been concerned about the impact of the growlers um, on humans and all living creatures in the region. And that, that led me to be involved with the SDA. The way I actually have learned to engage and address my concerns and my anger and my sense of helplessness about the location and the presence of the growlers is to be working with the Sound Defense Alliance. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen for just a bit and, um, and we'll start. Um, I give a talk once a year at the university about public health and war on Whidbey. This is a little over dramatic perhaps, but that's the way you feel if you actually live in the war zone of as collateral damage with uh, uh, military jets. And I know I'm not alone in thinking that from listening to my colleagues from other communities. Um, I, uh, let's see, okay. Um, the, just for context, here we are. We're in the Salish Sea, the home of the indigenous Coast Salish people through up through lower BC and uh, northwestern Washington inland waters. Um, the Salish Sea is also home to the southern part is the home of Puget Sound. Um, within Puget Sound, that little circle cir uh, um, in, encloses Whidbey Island and uh, located on the north end. Oh, oh, before I get too excited, I can tell you about the fact that Washington is basically a wash in military installations. It's a huge portion of the state's budget. Just in Puget Sound alone, we've got four naval bases. We have the we have a nuclear submarine base. We've got uh, research at the University of Washington. We have military and and naval air bases in this in the region. So we're we're there's plenty of company here. We're on Whidbey Island on the north end. There are the Whidbey air station is based in Oak Harbor, which is north of Coopville, where I live. And uh, Coopville is the home of uh, a small landing strip that was built for World War II planes. And uh, the Whidbey Island station is home to the sole site in the world to all of the US uh, E-18s that are used for electronic warfare. And they, they, that warfare uh, weapon is used to block communication. So unlike dropping nuclear bombs, it's 
um, used to interfere with communications of ground, ground troops. And all of them, uh, right now there are 118 based in the United States. They're all based on Whidbey Island. And we, are, we have grown from the first introduction in 2009 of about 80 planes. We've grown to 118 and there are plans to grow that number to 160 which has been uh, a long fat, fought battle, but uh, starting in 2012, uh, we were first able to get the courts to um, require an environmental impact statement. Um, and it sounds like things like that have been happening in, um, at least in, uh, in Wisconsin. And um, it took us a long time to convince the court to, that they needed an impact statement that took six years from the beginning to the point when the, uh, the Navy's impact statement was released. We, Coopville is a very small town of about 1200 people. Uh, with organizing, we generated 4,200 comments to, in response to the um, in, impact statement. Um, and Vicki, I was very inspired by 6,000. Uh, you may have more people living in the neighborhood, but we we spread out um, and, and found uh, a, a good response in the community against the expansion of the growlers. The expansion plan was to increase jet numbers by 44% and to increase flight activities, which is really for what the Navy is doing on Whidbey is practicing landing and takeoff. It's where pilots come to learn to and practice um, takeoffs and landings again and again and again. Prior to the EIS, they were limited to 6,000 of these operations a year. Following the EIS, they're now permitted to go to 24,000 takeoffs and landings. The takeoffs and landings happen in a circle, a nice little loop. Um, they're all at very low altitudes, lower than 500 feet, usually in the two to 300 feet directly over people's homes. And it happens repeatedly. Usually the uh, cycles of flights last for 45 minutes, usually involving three or four jets. It's endless when it happens um, and deafening and deeply disturbing as everyone has talked about so eloquently uh, earlier in this webinar. Um, the 2018 final decision really brought formal organizing to all of the community work that's been had been done around the sound in response to the EIS. And it led to the de development of uh, the Sound Defense Alliance and the EU, excuse me, let me go forward a minute. The Sound Defense Alliance really came because of everyone's frustration with trying to work with the Navy. The Navy had had a long relationship with the, many of the communities particularly on Whidbey, and with the introduction of the EA, EA-18s, really the sound barrier broke the relationship. The previous jets, the prowlers, um, were vastly quieter, uh, even though unpleasant, vastly quieter than the growlers. And the work of the SDA is to basically try to work and restore a balance between community priorities and military priorities. We feel very clearly, um, it's sort of an understatement, we feel very clearly that the balance is totally wrong, that the military's priorities vastly outweigh the community's priorities by, by uh, in orders of magnitude. And so we are working with communities around Puget Sound to try to work on our, to, to stop the expansion of the growlers and to move them to someplace else not just to stop them or relocate. We are not interested in relocating the Navy base. We are interested in relocating the growlers because of their effect on uh, their effect on every aspect of life. And I know um, from listening to Vicki and to James before, you've known these things. The, the impact of noise on health is 
The, they are numerous and well-documented studies related to the cognitive impairment for learning for children, hearing loss, cardiac events, sleep disturbance, depression, anxiety. And we have a lot of military veterans on Whidbey because of the Naval base and the Puget Sound location. We have lots of experiences of PTSD triggering um, from loud noises. These experiences make life miserable for people who live near, near in, in the shout range of the, of the base. Uh, basically, we found that the military is totally unwilling to engage with our efforts to engage with them. Um, and so we've moved on to our own strategies. And our strategies have been, they're all long haul in, uh, in focus. Um, one is to work with our elected representatives. We happen to have some good ones from Washington State. Um, Maria Cantwell, our senator, has been active and pushing, um, as has Adam Smith, who's the head of the, the Armed Forces Committee. He's a representative from um, Seattle area. We've gotten the Department of Defense to make an appropriation to actually measure sound, which sounds so simple, to actually measure the real noise related to growlers, not their modeled and averaged estimates. So um, that's been a helpful piece. We've also developed a very clear roadmap, a legislative and decision, military decision roadmap to get the, get the growlers slowly out of Whidbey and out of the, the, the environment of Puget Sound altogether because of its high population and environmental uh, fragility. Um, legally, like Vicki was talking about, we are um, in response to the EIS uh, record of decision in 2018, we began working on a legal suit under the National Environmental Protection Act, um, which is really the only thing you can sue the Navy about um, or the military about in this case, you have to sue based on the Environmental Protection Act. And um, Fortunately, this, our very aggressive and progressive uh, Secretary of, oh, Attorney General, excuse me, Attorney General Bob Ferguson joined with uh, one of our member organizations in the suit uh, to sue the Navy. Um, and more excitingly, the court hearings are finally beginning next week after long, long process of working through that, yeah, that game of the, of the lawsuit. So we hope um, that there will be something good coming out of that lawsuit. Um, and the last, uh, the third strategy is really to continue to do organizing and building our community, community support across the sound. In this case, Zoom has been our best friend. We've got lots of territory to cover. It doesn't look like many miles, but it takes hours to get places instead of you know, 20 minutes because of the differences of crossing water and difficult terrains. So um, that piece of community base building has been a big piece of our work. And the last is to talk, I want to talk about is our research related to the impact of noise. We have been, we have a history on Whidbey of actually having actively done concrete, significant noise studies ourselves. Um, that work has never been compiled. And we, again, didn't, only, we only did it just in Coopville and a few locations. With this past year, we went through the process of doing noise measurements all throughout the impact area, noise impact area of um, Whidbey Island Naval Air Base on different islands in different parts of the um, Whidbey Island and now have a terrific trove of past and just currently direct and uh, developed noise work. The biggest missing piece for us is that we don't have, hold on, I'm gonna get to some, another slide. Um, we don't have um, current uh, health assessments, uh, a current and long-term health assessment. The research that we've been doing um, has been led by a woman named Lauren Keene. Um, Lauren has done a significant body of work already. She's an ecologist focused on the impact of jet noise on life and she's done work on measuring the um, noise exposures underwater. The Navy had the temerity to suggest that growler jet noise would be penetrating to three feet and not much further, um, despite the fact that the Navy is sort of 
well clued into how noise ca carries underwater. But uh, anyway, uh, Lauren was able to measure um, very loud and clear measurements of growler jet overflights at 100 feet. And that's only based on the fact that her cord was 100 feet. If we'd only known, we would have got a lot longer cord to do the research. Um, the other piece that she's done is to measure um, noise impacts in the Olympic National Park, known in the United States as one of the quietest places on earth. The Olympic National Park, um, nobody else can fly in the Olympic National Park. They can fly over, the Navy can fly in the National Park and in, the Navy insists that the impacts are light. 88% um, of noise aircraft jet, uh, noise in the park comes from growler jets and it's pretty ceaseless. The Navy practices over there uh, using its, uh, targeting its electronic uh, warfare on moving targets throughout the park. Um, and the last piece of work that we've talked about, that I talked about is the re doing residential area jet noise measurement. Um, and our un unfinished work here is to really work taking all of the noise work that we've done, compiling it and comparing those noise levels to comparable studies of health impacts. We don't have health impacts. Health impact studies are massive and long-term, very expensive studies. We don't have them. And in fact, when you look at the type of noise that growlers um, and the growler exposure is in Puget Sound, you have three features that are unique. One is the incredibly high volume of flights, 24,000 a year. The second is the incredibly low altitude flights um, that when you're at two and 300 feet off the ground, the noise is much more significant. When you're in also at very high levels of between 110 and 121 is our last high regular high me measurement of noise exposure. So those three features are hard to find in replicated studies. So there is one that's available um, that was done in the, in that late 1980s in Japan that ties that level of noise, that kind of noise to health impacts. Our job in the next phase will be to take all of our noise level exposures and link them to uh, that comparable health impact study from Japan. It's a big, it's a big piece of um, research that we'll be trying to move forward on, but that's where we are. So that's, that's sort of what I got to say so, so far. Thank you, Christine, for that uh, great presentation. Uh, and certainly, I think if more people were aware of the sound and health impact posed by these fighter jets, especially affecting residential areas, I'd imagine companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin wouldn't be very successful. Our next speaker is Tamara Lorenx. Tamara is a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the No Fighter Jets Coalition. She's also a PhD candidate in global governance at Wilfrid Laurier University. Tamara will speak about her visit to Coal Lake in Alberta, the significant fighter jet presence there, the threat it poses to the indigenous communities who also live there. Uh, thank you, Tamara, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to be with you all and especially with our American activists who share in our struggle against fighter jets. So I'm speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral peoples. I'd like to dedicate my talk tonight to uh, my brother who passed away at this time last year. And I'd like to dedicate my remarks to the Cold Lake First Nations. Uh, we reached out to the Cold Lake First Nations to, to speak tonight and also to participate. Uh, indigenous people across this country, like the Cold Lake First Nations, have suffered tremendous trauma. Trauma is the theme of our event tonight. Trauma is the uh, emotional and physiological response to a deeply disturbing event or experience, and it, prof it causes profound pain. Canada's military and fighter jets have caused tremendous trauma for the um, Cold Lake First Nations here at home and for people uh, overseas. If Canada buys new fighter jets, most likely 
uh, it will buy the F-35. This is why we wanted to hear from our friends in Wisconsin and Vermont. The other option is the Boeing Super Hornet and the Saab Gripen. The Super Hornet is, um, is a very close variant to the Growlers. And this is why we wanted to hear from uh, Christine. So I'm gonna show you some slides tonight from my trip. And I'm just gonna get it up here. Um, there we go. So every aspect of a fighter jet causes trauma from the mining of the metals and the rare earth minerals to the production, training, displacement um, of people from their <laughs> land, the use of fighter jets, the carbon emissions, and the noise. Uh, they are forms of violence. <laughs> this, picture, this picture that you see is um, from the Marshall Mining Report done by the London Mining Network last year. It's available um, online and I'm going to share a link in the chat. In August, I went to Cold Lake, Alberta to see Canada's largest Air Force base and to meet with some of the people from uh, the First Nations there. I brought leaflets about the fighter jets. Um, I bought letters and I brought my banner and I wanted to warn them about the, the threat of, of a new fleet of fighter jets coming to their community. Now, Cold Lake is a major oil in a major oil sands development area. Uh, in the province, it is highly industrialized with oil wells, processing uh, plants and pipelines. It is also highly militarized, and I will speak more about that in a moment. The, uh, this land in, um, of, of central northern Alberta is the traditional territory of the Dene Suleni. The Dene people, uh, since time immemorial, have been on this land. Uh, for the Dene, the land is sacred. It is crucial to their identity, to their culture and survival. In 1876, the Dene signed Treaty 6, giving the, the Crown, uh, the, the Canadian government, uh, the British monarchy, some of the land. In exchange under the treaty, the Dene people were promised some land for their reserve and access to, to, to the land to maintain their traditional livelihood, their hunting and their gathering. Uh, the Dene people's governing body is the Cold Lake First Nations. In 1952, the federal government under Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent expropriated 3 million acres, effectively stole from the Dene people their land from an Air Force base. The federal government promised to make payments to, to lease this land and to return it to the people in 20 years, but this didn't happen. The federal government on this land that they took established a radar site, an Air Force base, and an air weapons testing range. And this was to meet obligations that they, that they felt they had, you know, under NORAD and under NATO. The uh, site expanded in 1978. Uh, eight, the Air Force began the Maple Leaf exercise. Uh, this is a massive international uh, Air Force training exercise and NATO allied forces come every year to do fighter jet testing. Uh, the Dene people complain to the federal government, they protest all to no avail. And then in 1995, they uh, held a peace camp on the Air Force range. So effectively preventing from the, the fighter jets from testing their weapons and they demanded a settlement. After six years of negotiations in 2002, the Cold Lake First Nations accepted a measly $25 million settlement for the loss of their land. This was, uh, this was so little. So uh, this is the land that they lost. Uh, there's the Air Force Base in, on the left, the, the, the uh, orange pink marks there. And then you can see the vast expanse of land for the air weapons range. This is in the black box. So the Dene people, they have lost their livelihood because of not being able to access for hunting and gathering. They became dependent on the state for, uh, for, for, uh, you know, for, for welfare. They became depressed. They, they talked about their depression at, um, at, during the negotiations, and uh, they, many of them became impoverished. 
The, the militarization of the land also caused the Dene people to lose uh, the caribou. They are also known as the caribou people and the woodland caribou of the boreal forest uh, is in decline right now. It's listed as an endangered species on the Federal Species at Risk Act. Um, there is tremendous environmental trauma there is extensive contamination at the Cold Lake Air Force Base. Uh, this is a slide from the Federal Contaminated Sites Inventory. It's a public database that you can search uh, for contaminated sites across the country. The Department of National Defense uh, has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contaminated sites. So this uh, Cold Lake first, uh, this, sorry, this um, CFB Cold Lake is contaminated with hydrocarbons, with uh, carcinogens, and this is from the use of petroleum products and from hazardous material that they need to power their, uh, their vehicles and their fighter jets. Uh, the Department of National Defense, you can see at the arrow, is right now doing a site-wide study on PFAS, those uh, forever chemicals that are uh, effectively carcinogens, and it is expected that, that um, it is widely contaminated with PFAS. Uh, I inquired with the, with the uh, federal environmental assessment body to see if there has been an environmental assessment of the planned fighter jet parachutes and there is no environmental assessment done. So I'd like to quickly uh, run through some slides um, of my trip to Cold Lake. It is very much a town that identifies and prioritizes fighter jets over uh, First Nations. So um, Cold Lake has a population of 15,000 people, 20% are Indigenous, about 3,000 people, and about half of them live on the reserve, which is divided into four parcels. They are not contiguous. As you enter Cold Lake from the highway, there are these nice uh, flags that greet you, but if you look closely at them, you can see that there are fighter jets on them. In the main intersection of the town, there are fighter jets mounted and prominently displayed. And there I am with my sign. Um, you can see uh, I, uh, the, the museum there. I, I, I spent a lot of time at the museum and you can see that they prioritize in their display the, the, the military, it's the uh, First Nations that have a very small room at the back and nowhere on in the display does it mention the fact that three million acres of land was stolen by the federal government from the Dene people. Um, they also mention uh, in the display uh, the residential schools, um, the, the Cold Lake First Nation, they went to Onion Lake and Blue Quills First Nation. I also visited the Native Friendship Center and all the First Nations, all the indigenous people that I spoke to, they talked to me about the problem of alcoholism and addiction in their community. You know, this is very much related to the intergenerational trauma that the community has experienced over many decades. I uh, was very privileged to have a tour with Mervyn Grambois, an indigenous man who spent two days with me uh, telling me about the community and introducing me to a key indigenous people. We met one morning with Nancy Scanny, an 83 year old elder. Uh, Nancy is a water keeper and uh, she's very much an activist. She was down in Standing Rock, uh, standing in, in solidarity. Her priority is working uh, with, with children and youth to try to preserve their culture and language. When I met with Nancy at her home, she um, we had to stop uh, speaking at, at one point because a fighter jet flew over and she said to me, do you hear that? They're, they're so loud. They fly over my house all of the time. And, um, you know, I'm going deaf. Look at my ears. I have hearing aids on both sides and both ears. Um, and her, uh, she was very happy to show me this picture that her grandchildren did, uh, badass grandma. And you know, she talks about the, the values of the Dene people and the need to respect the land, respect the water, and respect each other. She has seen fighter jets flying over the over Cold Lake and Primrose Lake, uh, dumping fuel 
on the, the water and in the forest. I also went to the Air Force Base, of course, and I protested outside. Uh, CFB Cold Lake is Canada's largest, busiest Air Force Base. This is where we have our tactical CF-18 fighter squadron. This is also where we station our CF-18 demonstration team. These are the fighter jets that have been flying over the country during uh, COVID and at air shows. This is also the site of the annual Maple Leaf International Exercise where you, you've got uh, countries from the United States, the UK, Belgium, France coming with their, with their fighter jets. Um, this is we, me with my, with my sign. I had it up for about 10 minutes and then the military police came and told me to, uh, to take it down. Um, this is the uh, school at the Air Force Base and you can see that the children have done art uh, these are fighter jets that they've painted and stuck to the fence of the school. At the Air Force Base, there are a few churches. And as I was leaving the pro my protest and my investigation of the base, I left the church, my leaflets, and um, this message, no fighter jets, no war. I passed out hundreds and hundreds of these leaflets all over the community, warning the community about um, you know, new fighter jets coming and the impact of noise and the climate crisis. And then I would like to close by uh, uh, sharing a picture that I saw at the Native Friendship Center. They had a number of posters about the Dene laws. The Dene laws are the sharing laws. And you can see Dene law three, love each other as much as possible. Dene law four, do not harm uh, people with actions. Um, the fighter jets are causing a lot of harm to the Cold Lake First Nation, to the caribou, to the land, uh, to people overseas. Canada's wars in, uh, in, in Serbia, in Iraq, and in um, in Syria, we have dropped thousands of bombs and in Libya have killed people, have destroyed civilian infrastructure. So we must um, use this indigenous wisdom and we must transition to a peaceful green economy. We are calling for a just transition of the military and of the aerospace and defense sector so that we can have green jobs in, in the care economy. We are also calling for land back and the land back movement should start with the military bases in this country. They should be given back to the indigenous people. We should close down Cold Lake Air Force Base and the air weapons range and, and turn it over to the Dene Selene. So I want to um, um, also just encourage you to join us in our movement to stop Canada from buying new fighter jets. The decision is going to be made in the next six months. And if we can put enough pressure on the government, we can stop this purchase. It's 88 fighter jets for $77 billion. We've delayed it for 10 years. If we, if we uh, coordinate, if we unify, if we have a strong voice, if we're out on the streets, we need to, you to be out on the streets the week of November 20 second when parliament is back in session to say no new fighter jets and as we turn it over to the next speaker i'm going to show slides from the toronto air show thanks thank you tamara for uh vividly conveying the threat posed by the fighter jets to the indigenous communities who live in cold lake you know our prime minister here in canada talks about how much he cares about indigenous people but as usual you know, your presentation certainly showed us that the government's words don't seem to match their actions. And uh, Vicky in her presentation briefly mentioned the Ho-Chunk Indigenous group allying with white rural people to fend off military projects. So with uh, Tamara and Vicky's presentations, it's great to hear about the international resistance being waged by Indigenous people against increasing militarization by these settler colonial governments. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is Mary Ellen Franker. Mary Ellen is a Catholic nun who has been actively involved in peace and justice movements for many years in several different cities. Presently a member of Pax Christi Toronto. She has particular concern about militarism as an expression of violent action, which causes tremendous death and destruction to the most vulnerable throughout the world. Mary Ellen uh, will be talking about her participating in the Toronto Air Show event. The Air Show event is an annual event featuring a display of military, government, and civilian aircraft 
primarily from Canada and the United States. And uh, tomorrow also has a couple of pictures that she will be uh, showing us uh, regarding uh, our protest uh, at the at the air show event. Thank you very much, Prasanna. And thank you to all the presenters so far. It's just incredible data that you just wish the whole world could hear. Um, as mentioned, uh, here in Toronto, the No Fighter Jets campaign members uh, chose to um, be present at the annual air show uh, to bring our message there to perhaps raise awareness. So my presentation will be different from the others, and I hope I bring maybe a slightly different dimension or approach to the understanding of trauma. Um, this, what I share is really based on my experience at the air show, my reflection on it. Um, so the, the air show this year on the uh, shores of Lake Ontario in Toronto was the first such show that I've ever experienced. While I have experienced performances of the snowbirds, the, the, the planes that were going to be on display, uh, I've experienced their performances at national holidays as part of the program. But this particular air show invites persons to come specifically for this demonstration of acrobatics. Um, and it was actually over two days. This year, the show was delighted to have perfect weather to attract the crowds. And indeed, there were crowds eager to watch and enjoy a picnic at the same time. There was truly a festive atmosphere. People we spoke to told us protesters that they came every year, would not miss it. The whole experience was such a strange experience of disconnect between the alluring entertainment that the people were experiencing and what we knew was going on behind the aerobatics. While a few persons on seeing our signs that Tamara showed you, um, they did thank us for being there and sharing our message. Very many made it clear that they did not wish us to spoil their day of enjoyment. And some made it quite clear that they were in full support of, of Canada's military defense. Many of the people we noticed were sporting caps whose design declared that they were advertising the company Lockheed Martin, which we knew was the leading contender for Canada's planned purchase of 88 new fighter jets. So Tamara is showing the, uh, the caps that they were sporting. When we asked attendees about these caps, they said they didn't know from whom they came. The caps had been passed out to persons arriving in the parking lot. And they were, for the people, a welcome gift on such a sunny day with a high UV index. The fact that the event, which we knew was clearly linked to fighter jets, whose sole purpose was killing and destruction, uh, was taking place in front of a prominent monument dedicated to peace and surrounded by a beautiful rose garden for peace. It just seemed totally lost, however, on all but us protesters. We attempted to engage persons in some conversation about the hats, about the person's possible knowledge of Canada's planned purchase of new fighter jets. 
the connection between the hearts and the company building the fighter jets, the very serious emissions of carbon by these fighter jets, and the use that such jets have had in the past and certainly will have in the future. Those we spoke to had no knowledge whatsoever of Canada's planned purchase of fighter jets. Those who were ready to listen to us were surprised both at the imminent purchase and the immense cost. They listened to the information we offered on the destructive consequences to human life and essential infrastructure with the use of these planes in uh, areas of conflict, which happened to be mostly in the Middle East. While they expressed some distress around this, they still wish to be able to take this time to enjoy a stimulating and entertaining air show. One lovely couple with whom I spoke came from a place of conflict in the Middle East. And they had had experience, or they had experienced the constant sense of vulnerability and the trauma of living in a war zone where safety was always in peril. Rather surprisingly for me, this experience had left them with a strengthened need for protection and defense. They wished Canada to have strong and adequate defense resources to meet the lurking dangers which could overwhelm at any moment. However, with further listening and, and compassion on my part, they came to acknowledge a deep hope for a secure peace with no weapons of war. And they wished this mostly for their precious little daughter who was there with them, whom they were holding in their arms. When asked by me how we together might work towards that hoped for future. They simply could not imagine a way. This experience for me illustrated the fact that, <laughs> I'm kind of putting it in quotes, trauma is traumatizing. Fear and vulnerability can rob human persons of imagination and hope to realize what they deeply desire and long for. Now, at the same time, uh, this couple expressed a great appreciation for the respectful conversation we had had and their desire for more such dialogue, which led me to wonder, could this be a sign of what people at the grassroots truly need. And uh, what could be a way, or could this be a way, this, this manner of dialogue, a way to a transformed vision for security and conflict transformation? For myself, listening to the deafening roar of the air show overhead, I could not help remembering the experience shared by Innu activist, Elizabeth Panashwe, whose indigenous community in Labrador in Eastern Canada, lived through the testing of Canada's present F-18 fighter jets some decades ago in Labrador in her area. I was struck when James was speaking earlier, when he was concerned about the testing of, of these jets in, in highly populated areas. And he commented, you know, there's lots of land in the US and Canada where it isn't densely populated, where that testing could happen. 
Well, the fact is, as Elizabeth Panashwe and the people in Cold Lake would tell us, those lands that seem to be uninhabited are actually traditional lands of Indigenous peoples whose uh, traditional life has been to be people who move. <laughs> They're not always in one place or have not been always in one place. So in the case of the Innu in Labrador, uh, the Canadian government, assuming that this land was open and uninhabited, then just went on to assume that this was land that could be used at the government and the military's desire, never, uh, never speaking, never dialoguing, never uh, consulting the Indigenous people whose traditional land it was. So what Elizabeth Panashawe shared with us, um, that wasn't only, although I mean the terrifying sound of the low level flight of the planes uh, was greatly traumatizing, both for the human population and the animal population living on the Innu land. Um, but so that was traumatic in itself, but also traumatic was the fact that testing means they also test the dropping of bombs on this land. And what remained on the land was contaminated. These barrels that were highly contaminated. This is land that these people depend on for their identity, as Tamara mentioned, their source of food and their spiritual foundation. Just a few months earlier, I had interviewed Elizabeth for an Earth Day event. As she shared with us, the Canadian military and federal government simply did not listen to nor understand the trauma of the Indigenous people. For persons that we spoke to uh, could hear the fact that the cost of new fighter jets was shocking in the light of the great needs in Canada, such as climate emergency, health care, housing and homelessness, education, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. However, much more discussion and information would be needed to fully help them to recognize that the diverted funds to militarism would indirectly cause trauma to many thousands of vulnerable, neglected Canadians. So the indirect influencing of ordinary Canadians at such innocent events as the annual air show uh, by the military complex is deeply disturbing and frightening. Appreciating the caps they sported, the Canadians at the air show were blinded to the fact uh, that a company like Lockheed Martin could be funding this air show. The company's underlying motivation is not likely the desire to entertain these people, but rather to amass huge profits from its defense contracts. From my personal perspective, this erosion of human sensitivity to the suffering of others through distraction and subtle manipulation of values is a huge tragedy and a violation of the human soul. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for sharing your uh, experience participating in the protests at the Toronto Air Show. I was also with you that day and uh, we got to speak to a great many number of people and uh, it was really a quite eye-opening experience. Uh, now we will uh, go to uh, the Q and A portion of our event, and we're going to uh, we're going to nine o'clock. Uh, so, uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, uh, put in the in the in the chat box or uh, 
or uh, raise your hand. Uh, does anybody, uh, first of all, have any questions for the filmmakers, uh, Dwayne and Patrick, in response to their films? Any comments? Well, Dwayne and Patrick, I did receive a question about how your film was received afterwards and if you could tell us a little bit about the aftermath of the film once it was sure. released. Yes, um, uh, much to our uh, pleasure and, and sort of surprise, the local media here in Burlington really latched onto this film. I think it was the, the first time that um, that the that the most of the mainstream media in this area really took the people's lived experiences on the ground seriously. Um, so I, uh, one of the things I'm proudest of is is the way that it kind of um, reinvigorated the conversation here, um, and 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 we've been you know sharing it with groups like this um, since. And so it's really, um, it's been wonderful to see people um, empathize with the people on the ground here, uh, and, and and it's been. Uh, our work to kind of be the conduit for that, I, th I think. Yeah, and I, I would just add, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm face muted because I'm, I'm holding a uh, four month old right now. Um, it was a little fussy. Um, I would add, we were, we were, we didn't get into this to sort of like, we didn't realize that the, um, that we would be talking to every local news outlet over the span of a couple months, like literally every local outlet um, picked it up with the exception of our local public radio station, um, which is still a little bit of a thorn in our side that we that we missed that one. But um, we were like, we felt so compelled by the voicemails we received to like push push the film as far as we could and try to reach as many people as we could because everybody who left a voicemail was so honest with us and sounded so hopeless that like you know I still find a lot of hope in raising a stink about this like you know to for for people like myself and Dwayne and certainly Jimmy and Roseanne and you know many others in Vermont like there should never be an accepted status quo that these jets are here um, and so there's never you know enough that we can do to raise that issue especially in the local press I think there's demand to see that four month old. <laughs> does, um, does anybody have a, any other questions for the filmmakers or for the, uh, the, the other speakers? Or any comments as well? I would also add to like I, I would plug Jimmy's Substack again, and then I would say, um, you know, connect any group uh, that you see. Um, you know, we're we're just we're happy to be growing our network of un like understanding you know jet and noise resistance and all these peace groups across the country. So please do stay in touch because Dwayne and I are still developing our project to this day and and looking out to new horizons of how we can continue to make noise about this. So um, yeah, please do uh, stay in touch. Sorry. Uh, Colin Stewart has his hand up. Uh, please Colin, go ahead. Yeah, just a, a quick request to Tamara, if she could. Um, the slides that she held, held up, I think would be really helpful. Is there a way to get hold of those, Tamara? I'm particularly interested in the one that has all the components of the, the aircraft right at the beginning. Um, my, and I ask that because I think we really need to do a very deep analysis of the energy content of each of these F-35s um, here in BC. And I, I also appreciated um, the folks from Puget Sound, the Alliance, because uh, I'm living out here. I think it's time for some, some linkage with, with them and the Canadian military here. In, see what they're doing here in Esquimalt and in British Columbia. So just in response to Colin, I'll say that, uh, yes, it, uh, 
let's get the slides from uh, from Christine and I'm happy to share my slides and I also want to let people know that the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom um, um, has given me some money to prepare a report on the adverse cumulative impacts of fighter jets. And so the report's almost done and it should be ready in the next uh, week or two. And it's going to um, you know, be professionally designed and we're gonna translate parts of it and we're gonna do social media and graphics and we're gonna try to send it uh, to the government. Um, and then just to say that you know, these fighter jets are about 13,000 kilograms, 20,000 pounds. Um, they fly, you know, it's one pilot. Sometimes there's a weapons operator with them, but then they carry, you know, maybe four to, to a dozen bombs and, and missiles. And so all of the, 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 the minerals that are that are needed, all of the rare earth minerals that are that are required, you know, to, for you know, for a fighter jet to just to drop a bomb, it's just it's so ridiculous. And then I I also just want to I see that Jonathan Down is on the call and he's very concerned about um, nuclear weapons and the F thirty five, like Patrick and Duane said, is a nuclear weapons delivery system. Oh, I think James uh, might have said that <laughs> uh, too. Uh, so, you know, Canada will be in violation, in my opinion, of its uh, um, uh, of its uh, obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty if it buys the F-35. Um, uh, you know, you can read about it in the in the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review. So we 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 have to really mobilize together hard here in Canada to stop the Canadian government from getting not just the F-35s but any of these planes because they are just going to cause a tremendous amount of, of of problems, terrible impacts all around. We have uh, two questions from James. Uh, one question, uh, sorry, from from Jonathan. One question is for James. Uh, uh, what do uh, Senator Sanders and uh, Senator Patrick Leahy say about um, the, the basing of the, the, the fighter jets in, in, in Burlington, Vermont? That uh, question's for James. And there's another question. Uh, I think this could also be addressed to um, Christine as well uh, and, uh, and James and, uh, and the filmmakers even. What are the perceived benefits for Burlington and Whidbey Island for the use of their airspace? So. The, those are two questions. On the, on the, on the, on our two senators from Vermont, Pat Leahy and Bernie Sanders, they're both supporters of the uh, basing of the F-35. In fact, the entire political and military establishment in, in Vermont are three members of, of Congress, including Bernie and uh, Pat Leahy, and uh, and our um, our governor, our former governor, the mayor of Burlington, the entire uh, business community, uh, they're all supporting the F-35 basing in in the city of uh, South Burlington. The, the and the, they don't really have good explanation. They just support it. The, the reasons they give is jobs, um, that somehow there's going to be employment, which there really isn't, um, uh, other than the actual members of the military who would continue to be employed even if we didn't have the F-35. Um, and um, that, that's, they, don't, they don't really even talk about national security. Um, they say it's a federal mission instead. That's the, uh, the, the buzzword, federal mission. So it's a very vague formulation. It doesn't really say that it has to do with national security because there is no national security reason to put it in a city that actually makes it insecure because it makes it a target. Um, and um, so what is federal mission? That means I think that really means that the Air Force has rule about the number of flight hours a pilot must have with an airplane to be continue to be certified 
to be a pilot for that plane. So that's the federal mission that they need to have some unspecified number of flight hours every year. But they don't need to do that in a, from a runway in a city. So uh, that the, the two things that our senators have done the most of is avoid contact with anyone who might question them about the F-35. They've refused to meet with uh, anyone who's opposed to the F-35. So for the last 10 years since this plan was implemented, we haven't been able to have a meeting even with their, uh, well, with them certainly, um, if we go in large group, we're able to stand outside the door of Pat Leahy's office and talk through the window to one of the staffers. But other than that, they avoid any, any contact. It's democracy in shambles. Would the filmmakers also like to comment on uh, the, the perceived benefits for Burlington? If Christine could comment on the perceived ben benefits for Whidbey Island uh, for the use of the aerospace. I would, I would just quickly add that the, the absurdity of this, uh, this supposed jobs program never comes with a price tag attached. These are some of the most expensive jobs you can create. And meanwhile, Vermont has a thriving or budding renewable energy job sector that is completely ignored in this calculus of what types of jobs we're creating. This is like saying, we've never produced so much food in our life and it's all dog food. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like this, these aren't the jobs that our people need. And at the exact same time, we have a crisis of a supposed brain drain. When I was coming into professional age, the Vermont brain drain was at the top of every headline that kids were leaving the state. And wouldn't you know it, we now have a massively inflated housing market. If you ever look at the average cost of rent in Burlington, Vermont, it is higher than New York City. Manhattan is supposedly the most expensive place to rent in the country. And I would say Burlington has it beat. And you have nurses literally leaving the state to be able to afford a place to live one such, literally in my family, people have left the state just to be able to own a house and work one job, right? And so if you think we're losing our nurses, our teachers, we're, we're use, we don't have you know, union construction jobs, et cetera, et cetera, these things have all left the state. And meanwhile, what we're clinging on to is this false sense of security in Lockheed Martin, like wrapping itself around our local economy, like a boa constrictor, frankly. So. I think it's uh, demoralizing that the one line we do get about this is that it creates jobs. Nobody feels that. I'd like to jump in here. Um, so you didn't ask about Wisconsin, about Madison. You could have asked the same question. You would have gotten the same answers. But another answer we've gotten from Senator Baldwin is that she, um, she really appreciates the, F, the 115th fighter wing. They're great pilots. And they want to live in Madison because it's a great place to live. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, well, and it, most of the people who um, work at the base don't live near the base. So for what, what it's worth, you know, they commute from the outlying areas. But, you know, between that and the jobs, that's, that's the lame excuse. I, I think Vicky has touched upon the real reason for the basing in, in Burlington as well, because the pilots don't wanna be far away from a fun evening out. They like to have the city life. And so th that's why they lobbied the Senator Leahy to be at the Burlington airport. Um, so it's really a matter of convenience, not military necessity convenience for the pilots so that they can enjoy the pleasures of city of city life. And, and Burlington is a great city. It's got several universities, lots of bars and restaurants. It's got good school systems in the area. Mm. There's things to do. There's lots of tourists from Canada who come here. So, um, you know, they're right. It is a good place, but it isn't the place for the military. Not Now, I don't advocate I, an answer to some, I don't advocate for them to go 
somewhere else. I want them to abolish the F-35, mm -hmm. but I do point out that this is a bad place. So, you know, because if, if, we, can, if we can eliminate it, my view, if we can eliminate it from any of these places where they are, whether it's Woodby Island or Wisconsin or Madison or Burlington or anywhere, it puts their whole program in danger. Uh, Christine, would you like to quickly comment on the question about the perceived benefits for Whitby Island uh, for using yeah. their airspace? Yeah, I think it's um, very similar to what others have said. There's a um, remarkably uh, blind uh, association of patriotism to defense spending. Democrats and Republicans alike. Patty Murray, who is one of the most senior, um, she's our most senior senator uh, to the to on the national level, has enormous power, is chair of the armed services, the veterans world. She's totally tied. She actually lives on Whidbey, but I swear there's a there's a, a GPS tracking system out of the Navy that never allows federally elected people to hear the growlers. She's further south. Um, there's a perception that, that it's incredibly valuable. The military on Whitby um, comprises about 20% of the, of the um, budget, um, sort of the income base of the island. And like um, Patrick was saying, I think earlier, the, the lack of the ability to diversify the workforce is part of the Navy's role is to sort of stultify um, what the, the island can accommodate and can cult, cultivate in terms of the economy. But um, I think that uh, the other point that James made about whether Burlington is attractive, the information we have about Whidbey Island is that it's the most requested naval site, naval base site for location, you know, for living there of any in the country. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and it's really popular. And why they're on Whidbey is why they're why the why the uh, growlers around Whidbey is often associated with. It's a really lovely place to live. Thank, thank you, Christine, and a big thank you to all our speakers and uh, everyone who attended this event. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is this has been a, an amazing event. Uh, we will be sharing the recording of this event on our social media networks. Uh, please uh, visit our website, uh, nofighterjets.ca, uh, uh, for more information about what our coalition is doing uh, to stop the Canadian government from purchasing uh, the 88 uh, fighter jets. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, uh, have a great day. But wait. Uh, before you leave, oh. uh, Pitasana, um, I just want to tell everybody that our, our that um, uh, we are having our next meeting on Monday, October twenty fifth at uh, four p.m. Um, you can stay tuned with us through the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. We are also raising money for our Week of Action in November. We really need uh, funds, so please, uh, you can send money to the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace or, or World Beyond War Canada. Uh, these two organizations are help leading the No Fighter Jets Coalition. So friends, if we work together, we can stop the Canadian government from buying new fighter jets, but it's going to require us to get really active. Um, so if you can help, that would be great. Um, so we're having a meeting on Monday, but we're also having an event with Eve Engler this Sunday at two o'clock about his new book, Standing on Guard for Whom? It's a people's history of the Canadian military. You can find out all of this information on nofighterjets.ca. So thank you for letting me make this appeal. It's been a long night, but we've learned so much. I hope we're all inspired to take action. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Pitasana, very much for moderating. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>